Welcome to Inside the Americas with me, Jeannie Godula, coming up. After two months of violent protests and faced with growing censorship, journalists in Venezuela take to the city's buses to get the news out. There's new competition for American businesses, but these days it's coming from inside the United States. And the world's fastest man has run his last race on home soil. We'll go to Jamaica and the home village of Usain Bolt. But first, we'll start in Venezuela, where violent protests against the president have been going on for the past two months. The situation is becoming more and more difficult for journalists there faced with government censorship. Venezuela ranks 137th out of 180 countries when it comes to press freedom. And as the government cracks down further on newspapers and broadcasters, some Venezuelan reporters are finding new ways of getting the news out. Emerald Maxwell explains. These journalists aren't letting a little thing like censorship get in the way of the story. They're joining Venezuelans live on their way into work. Frustrated by government pressure not to cover certain subjects on air, the bus TV team hops on and off buses around Caracas, delivering the news in person. In these times as journalists, we've had to reinvent ourselves in order for information to reach the greatest number of people. We talk about the reality that citizens witness in their day to day, which they don't see reflected in other media. The reporters cover everything from sports and entertainment to politics and, of course, the protests, which aren't broadcast on state television. As rumors proliferate on social media, the team says they're aiming to reach people with the truth and bus TV is spreading to other Venezuelan cities. There are lots of people who don't read and bus TV gives another perspective on what they're living and what they're watching. President Nicolas Maduro accuses the private media of being part of a capitalist conspiracy against his socialist leadership. Authorities have taken the Spanish language CNN off air and media rights groups say newspapers are being denied paper to print on, have been sued or are being bought up by companies loyal to the regime. Let's take a look now at the big stories this week out of the United States. Attorney General Jeff Sessions gave more than two hours of sometimes heated testimony Tuesday at his Senate hearing. Sessions was grilled by his former colleagues over allegations Russia influenced last year's presidential election. The Attorney General flatly denied he'd held a secret meeting with Russia's ambassador and has vowed to defend himself against what he called false allegations. The American college student who was released from a North Korean prison is finally home, but in a coma in hospital. Otto Warmbier was serving a 15-year prison term with hard labor in North Korea for alleged anti-state acts. His parents said they were told he's been in a coma since his trial when he was last seen in public, and they learned of this only one week ago. And the first family is together again under the same roof, the White House. After nearly five months of living apart, this week, President Donald Trump's wife, Melania, said she and the couple's young son, Barron, have finally moved into the executive mansion. Mother and son broke with tradition by living at Trump Tower in New York since the inauguration so that Barron, who's now 11, could finish the school year uninterrupted. These days, the competition for American businesses often isn't Mexico, China, or some other country promising cheap wages and low taxes. In many cases, local communities are vying with cities that aren't very far away. The race to woo companies has intensified as state and local governments struggle with a slow economic recovery. Many older industrial cities in the U.S. see tax incentives as one of the few levers they can pull. But it can be very expensive, as our Pierre Delroux reports. A brand new manufacturing plant. This company, which specializes in handmade American football helmets, hires some 400 workers. It recently relocated its entire production just one city over. A strategic move for corporate, which doesn't change much for employees. This plant is only like five minutes away from the old one. We're in a different city, but the other plant was only like five minutes away. The move from Illyria, Ohio to North Ridgefield, just two kilometers away, allowed the company to save thousands in local taxes. 
For their payroll taxes, it's actually an improvement. It went from 2.5% in Elyria down to 1% for the city of North Ridgeville. It definitely helped us save money. All right, how's it going? In addition to tax Good. breaks, the city of North Ridgefield also yeah, yeah, paid for new roads and parking lots. In exchange, the company pledged to hire 40 new local workers. The operation cost the small town of roughly 30,000 inhabitants $5 million. But according to its mayor, North Ridgefield didn't have much of a choice. They will come to the city and say, do you have incentives to help me move here or to help me grow my business? Because if you don't, I'm going to go somewhere else. So you have to be in the game, offer incentives, or you're not going to see growth in, the, in, the, in businesses in your city. Since the recession of 2008, American cities have feared one thing, job losses. President Donald Trump himself promoted city-to-city -city or state-to-state -state relocations as a solution to keep jobs in the United States. You can move from South Carolina back to Michigan. You can do anywhere. You've got a lot of states at play, a lot of competition. And I don't care as long as it's within the United States. But the situation has led to abuses from some companies, moving from one state to the next and back to accumulate tax breaks with catastrophic consequences for local and state governments. Happen. What happens is the state goes broke and they end up not funding roads and bridges and health care and schools. When it comes to attracting jobs, any solution goes. This old limestone mine near Kansas City was turned into the world's largest underground storage facility. Welcome to Subtropolis. Uh, you are currently 150 feet below the surface. Every day, some 1,500 employees come to work for one of the 50 different companies who have set up shop here, mostly for tax purposes. On the surface, they'd be paying about $1.30 a square foot. Here, they're paying 30 cents a square foot. So it's about a fourth of the cost to be here from a real estate tax perspective. In the race to attract jobs, communities across the country have spent an estimated 40 to 45 billion dollars in tax cuts and incentives in 2015 alone. Among the many measures U.S. President Donald Trump is hoping to put into place is a move to reverse his predecessor's efforts to open up to Cuba. One of those could deal a big blow to a burgeoning business, cruise ships heading for Havana. Florence Gaillard and Nick Rushworth report. People in Havana are getting used to seeing luxury liners slide by. But for the cruise company operating this vessel, Cuba is the start of a new age of business with a destination long cut off from the United States. This really fills in an opportunity that we have wanted to provide to our guests for decades. The US and Cuba, former Cold War foes, announced a detente in December 2014 the Obama administration eased travel restrictions the following month. There are now triple the number of American visitors to Cuba. Cubans for Americans has always been the forbidden fruit, the place that everyone wants to come, but they did not know how to, how to come to Cuba, whether it was legal, whether it was illegal. Americans have ID checks on arrival. Getting a visa has been made much easier. Havana is a whole new destination. My dad came here on a vacation in the early 60s, and that's the last time I think anybody came. This is so exciting being here for the first time, coming up to the port and seeing the city frozen in time. I can't wait to get in there. There's none of the fast food they're used to or the American labels. Taking a seat in a central square is the starting point. Cubans call the Yanks UMass, and they're welcome as a source of cash and tips. The tourism with cruise liners is all-inclusive, but passengers really consume when they visit. They like to come and try the gastronomic offerings. They always consume. European travelers have long had access to Cuba. More are visiting. However, for Americans, any trade and travel restrictions under the Trump administration could stop the American tourist surge in its tracks. It's time now for our Inside the Americas number of the week, 9.58. That is Usain Bolt's record-breaking time for the 100-meter dash. The multiple Olympic and world gold medalist is due to retire after the World Championships in London this August. Here's a look back now at...
the rise of the fastest man in the world from his roots in Jamaica. Life may move at a slow pace in Sherwood Content, but not for its hometown hero, the world's fastest man, Usain Bolt. Born here 30 years ago, teachers spotted his sporting talent early on. Sometimes I would run so fast, sometimes I would cry when others would beat him. But as teachers, we always encourage him not to give up. And today we are surprised to know that he's such a superstar. He's our hero. Lightning Bolt, as he's known, is an eight-time Olympic gold medalist and the world record holder for both the 100 and 200 metre sprint. But the grocer's son never forgot where it all started. Bolt regularly donates money to local causes. I don't think he changed. When he comes home, he's the same person. He goes by the road, meet the people the same way, give them what he, give them money. People come, Mr. Bolt, I don't have this, Mr. Bolt. My mother is sick, Mr. Bolt. You know, so it's a lot. No one knows what Usain Bolt will do with his impending retirement, but locals hope he'll continue to provide inspiration to younger generations. I hope we get a chance to have him here providing a little bit more motivation for our children. And I have no doubt that now that he will have a little bit more time, we are going to be a part of what he plans to do. Bolt will compete in the 2017 London World Championships, his final international competition, before hanging up his running shoes. And it was a very emotional farewell for Usain Bolt in his home country. This week, he ran his final 100 meters sprint on Jamaican soil. Bolt uh, wanted to go out in a blaze of glory, and he did as he won the 100 meter salute to a legend race in front of a raucous crowd of 30,000 people. That was on the very same track where he launched his international career at the World Juniors in 2002. We'll leave you with those pictures of celebrations and see you again next time for the next Inside the Americas. Across Africa, presented by Georgia Calvin Smith. From North to South Africa, from Bamako to Nairobi, from Accra to Mogadishu. Bringing you all the political, economic, cultural and social news from Africa for a better insight into an ever-changing continent. Across Africa on Fosfancat and Fosfancat.com.